Good day, everybody. Welcome to the Lifetime Training Podcast, and I can't wait to bring you today Mr. Phil Campbell. Phil is a strength coach and author of several books, and he is the creator of the program topic we're going to talk about today called Sprint 8, and you are not going to want to miss this episode. This is some great stuff. You're going to love the results. You might not like it while you're doing it, but nothing can be better than what you're doing in this particular program for your health and happiness. And we will get into the details today. So welcome to the show, Phil. Well, thanks. It's great pleasure to be here and a great honor as well, because I've known Jason for several years now. And uh, this guy's one of the most well-read uh, trainer educators you'll ever meet. So it's an honor to be here with you today. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I still remember that first day I met you and you put me through this, this, this program, uh, you know, at the club sport, San Jose and man, it, you know, and I just did it this morning and I'm still, you know, feeling a little wonky, but let, let's get into it for the listeners. And, you know, I know you've been a speed coach for many, many years at a high, high level. And, you know, that evidently led you to coming up with this sprint eight. So can you go into that story of how did you come up with, you know, and what is sprint eight? Well, it, it's kind of an interesting story. I wish I could say I was working on a PhD. This was a dissertation, and I set out to do this all my life, but I did it. Somewhat an accident. Basically, I did the long, slow jogging like everybody else did uh, in a career, uh, managing hospitals. Uh, but I've been doing you know, speed coaching part-time uh, and full-time for about 45 years. And so I'd seen some great results from that, but I, I started doing the long, slow and beating up my skeleton uh, my health, my lab reports were not all that good. But what was interesting is I played football, flag football with the guys that I went to high school with, graduated in 1970, which is a long time ago. But we went to the old high school, Isaac Litton in Nashville, and played the turkey bowl, obviously. And what I would do is rather than jogging, I started doing sprints about a month before the turkey bowl. And when I did that, my energy would skyrocket, the weight would fall off, I felt so much better. Uh, and my body would just change during that during that 30 day period. And so quite by accident, I said, you know, what would happen if I did this all year long? And so I started doing sprint running uh, and then everything changed. Labs changed. My dad died of a massive MI and when he was 50 years old. Uh, so I went from being the basically the highest cardiac risk you can be as a human being, as a young man, to the lowest. And um, 68 today, no heart issues, no medications. Uh, health is really great. Have a lot of energy, a lot more energy uh, than, uh, than a lot of folks that, I, that, that yeah. used to play in the turkey bowl years ago. And so that's how Sprint 8 initially started. And so I'd go to the gym and I, sometimes I couldn't even work out because people were asking me questions about the Sprint 8. So I put it together in a white paper. And then after that, I got so many questions. People started saying, well, what about this? What about this? How does this work? So the white paper turned into a book. It ended up being over 400 pages with uh, hundreds of citations, research-based citations, pointing all pointing to this, this fact that we need to do a lot more intensity, recruit more muscle fiber, work both processes, the heart muscle, the aerobic process, but also the anaerobic process. And that's how Sprint 8 started. Got it. And, you know, a couple of things that you said in there and for the, you know, the trainer folks out there, you know, everybody sometimes listens to things with an agenda to, to poke holes in it. And, you know, you had said you were sprinting, but yet it was hard on your skeleton. And, and that was one of the reasons why you came up with it. And obviously, you know, in the back of my mind as a trainer and, and knowing, you know, sprinting could be very hard and is very hard on, you know, a lot of pounding. Um, but then you've been able to create this thing and change this thing to be able to do it pretty much on almost any piece of cardio, you know, that's out there, but I know there's preferred pieces, which we'll get into a little bit later. So I wanted to, you know, make sure people weren't going, okay, what's going on there. And, you know, as, as a lot of trainers do. So, you know, before we get into some of the science and, and what it is and how to do it and all that stuff, you know, the thing that I've, I've read and, and we've talked about quite a bit, is, you know, hit, you know, high intensity interval training has been so watered down where everybody's saying they're doing, it. you can go to a, you know, a 45 minute class where they're nonstop moving throughout the entire 45 minute class. And they're saying that that's hit. And I know that you've differentiated recently because of that. And actually the military has. So would you mind going into explaining the difference between 
sit in what you call sit and hit? I can if if and if I, it's okay to pop up these slides. Yeah, absolutely. Very quickly, it, it kind of tells the story uh, a little bit, a little bit easier than. Uh, so basically, you know, we've got different categories of exercise, and what happened with hit? Hit ten years ago was a lot more intense. Twenty years ago, it was significantly more intense than it is today. So the modern interpretation of hit over the years has become so watered down. The U.S. Army, about five, seven years ago, created the term SIT. So if you can see my cursor there, and this is the way I described it. You've got activity, traditional cardio, then you have HIT, which looks like, you know, uh, today, any oscillating on program and off program that can be hard gets the title of HIT. I've heard HIT yoga recently. Now, I'm not sure how they got that, but, you know, that's what's happened to HIT. And so the military said, we've got to distinguish the difference between this and real hard sprint intensity. So they came up with the term sprint interval training or sprint intensity training. And that's what sprint aid is. And for years, I described it like this, but actually it's really much more like what's on the slide. There's a significant difference between the two. And it's really driven by muscle fiber recruitment. Got it. And and, and Phil, to, to, to carry on with that is, you know, literally about two hours before this recording, I did the sprint aid uh, on a Versa climber, which probably isn't the, the best choice of equipment to use when you're just starting out with this program. (laughs) And I'm telling you, I have not made it past four of these intervals. I did three intervals, my legs locked up. Like I I just, I had to sit, I took my Theragun and I was just Theragun and after just to get some of that lactate and my, my quads felt like they were the biggest I've ever had them. So, you know, there, and, and, and I've been doing, you know, alpha classes at lifetime or, you know, what some people call CrossFit, different things like that. I've done orange theory. I've done F45 and never, you know, very rarely, I should say, have I ever felt what I felt in literally a minute and a half's worth of work. <laughs> so, you know, there's a difference if you're doing it right. And, and, and that's interesting about sprint eight because we, we've learned a lot about it over the years, but it's still the basic program. So if it's sprint running, it's actually sprint 60 meters or 70 yards on a football field, spending a minute and a half coming back. And you don't want to rush that recovery because that's how long it takes to get your fast switch fiber recovery. So it's not, a, it. it looks like a three to one ratio and it can be, but at the same time, it's not about the ratio because the human body needs 90 seconds for all three muscle fiber types to recover. So you can go and recruit all three muscle fiber types on, on the next sprint. And so sprint swimming, for example, is a good demonstration of how the, the intensity relates. So if you're an average swimmer, it, it would be sprint swimming as fast as you can for 25 meters, hanging on the side for a minute and a half, sprinting back. Now, if you're literally still <laughs> sprinter, with great technique, you have to probably make the turn and come back 50 meters full speed as fast as you can to equal the same intensity of guys like me and, and average swimmers. And so we figured out over the years how to do this with different pieces of equipment, but it's taken you know, quite, a, quite a few years to get there. But like the recumbent, I used to love to show the sprint eight on the recumbent cycle because in the slow twitch world, you know, you can sit there and watch a movie, look at the calories you burned at the end, but it's not really that much. A sprint eight on a recumbent cycle is one of the toughest workouts you'll ever do, but it's great for people with joint issues, backs, and that sort of thing. But then you selected one of the hardest ways, and that <laughs> is anytime you do a sprint on that piece of equipment, like a fan bike or an elliptical, where it's an upper body sprint and a lower body sprint, now your heart muscle and your lungs and your lungs have to work extremely hard to oxygenate a lot more muscle fiber. So your heart rate goes to its true max. But within that process, you condition the aerobic process and the anaerobic process, and you release so much exercise and these growth hormone that if we pulled your blood after doing sprint eight, more probably than not, you would test false positive for injecting it. It's <laughs> not just a little bit of growth hormone. There's numerous studies, University of Virginia Medical Strength Center, Richard Godfrey, uh, Brunel, Lots of studies showing you get this huge release of growth hormone. And once it's released, it says circulating your body, going after body fat for two full hours, like you're doing hard cardio. So you do get synergy and fitness when you target exercise and growth hormone 
And that's one of the main reasons why we create Sprint 8 is how do you target the most growth hormone in the shortest amount of time in a safe way? And so recumbent cycle, you can do it on a treadmill. The only difference on a treadmill is because you're running and you're towing off and up, when you're sprint running, you're propelling the body six or seven feet forward with every step. So it's very intense. On a treadmill, even though you may be running uphill, you're towing up as the belt comes around, so it's significantly less intense. So sprint running at 60 meters as fast as you can. Sprint Sprinting on a treadmill is 30 seconds to get the intensity necessary to qualify for that huge release of growth hormone. Got it. So, you know, we've gone into some of these, the science and the details and, you know, we haven't really talked about what is it? Uh, so would you dive into, you know, exactly what is it? And then let's keep continuing diving into that science behind, you know, all the benefits and, you know, how to do it properly. Come back to this slide right here. And yep. this really does a good job explaining it. So it's a three minute warm up because we want your heart rate to slowly ramp up. So any piece of cardio equipment, this would be it. Now, some, you know, Matrix makes cardio with a sprint eight button. You push it in. That's definitely helpful and has a great measurement system at the end. But you can do it pushing buttons. But the key is when you get up to that first sprint, you want to make it hard and fast as you can. It's not like a, a cycling class where sometimes you get blind speed. It has to be hard and fast to accomplish it. And the rule is, the 30-second rule is, if you can go longer than 30 seconds, don't count it. That means you didn't recruit your fast switch fiber if you can go on. Like if I'm saying 30 seconds, you stop at 30 because I'm saying 30 when you could have went 33 or 34, that's not a cardio sprint. So it has to be all out. And if you can't make the 30 seconds, that's positive to a degree. That says you're doing it correctly. So we, we tell people, start with that one hard cardio sprint after a three-minute warm-up. Now, if you're sprint running, sprint swimming, you have to warm up differently because sprint running is very intense on the hamstring, so it takes – a little bit more, but on piece of, most pieces of cardio, it, it's just three minute warm ups adequate. And then you drop it down. So this may go up to level 15, level 20, level 30, depending on the unit. And so during the cardio sprint, but immediately after, drop it to level one or two and go nice and easy. This is not cardio, this is recovery. So you're trying to intentionally go really slow, but still moving. So it's an active recovery, but you're trying to get all three muscle fiber types recruited so you can recruit them in the next sprint. So it truly qualifies as a cardio sprint. Got it. So, so a couple of things there, Phil, and, and I'm glad that you made me feel a lot better about myself because in those three repetitions and four repetitions, I didn't make it the full 30 seconds on all of them. I stopped at about 22 or 25. <laughs> um, so thanks. That's great. But on the flip side, you mentioned there's different pieces of equipment that you do this on. So, um, you know, understanding how to adjust speed, which is a big thing that you mentioned, it has to be full out as fast as you possibly can, but then also with the resistance. So if you're doing it on an elliptical machine uh, or a, or a recumbent bike or a bike, you know, how do we adjust those, those guys? And if you want to get into that later, we can get into that later uh, and we can continue. It's, it's basically the, the same program. But once you feel the sprint the correct way, it's, it's easier to learn how to do it. Uh, for example, the, the treadmill is the most difficult way to learn how to do sprint eight because when you're on those other modalities, you determine the velocity of movement. So you're in control of going as hard as you can, as fast as you can for that moment in time. Whereas a treadmill, your finger made the adjustment to select the velocity and the incline before you started. And so, that it takes a while to understand how to do it on the treadmill. But if you try it on a recumbent cycle or upright or elliptical, you get a feel for it very, very quickly. Which is how to do it. Once you yeah. get the feel, it's easier to replicate it. But the key thing to understand it's pacing is your enemy. Pacing is the body trying not to recruit fat switch fiber and conserve that fiber in case you need it for an emergency situation. And it's the research has actually named that. I've talked about it for about 30 years. But the researchers named it a few years ago called the exercise paradox. And so if your brain's confronted with a couple of different ways of doing things, you may take the stairs, but your brain first said, there's the elevator. That's what your brain does. It, it always opts for the easiest way to do things. And so when you're doing sprint intensity cardio, your brain is almost fighting you a little bit to say, pace, back off, do this. This is too hard. I'm too old. I'm too young. 
you know, your brain plays games with you, but you're doing some great things for your brain because we tested dopamine on two people. It doubled in one and almost tripled in another one. So you get the runners high every time you do sprint eight, even if it's just a couple of reps. Yep. And so going up to three is really tough. But when you said, I only got three and I got like 23, 24 seconds. That tells me you did it right. <laughs> it's funny like, I did all eight, 30 seconds, no problem. Yeah. They didn't do it right. And it's, when I hear that, I'll say, well, let, me, let me show you how to do it. <laughs> Even guys that do 100-mile events, and I've seen this several times, yeah. guys that do 100-mile events think, piece of cake, recumbent cycle, no problem. They get on there, usually by rep four, definitely by rep five, they're nauseous. And they it, can't get because they spend hours and hours practicing yeah. how not to recruit fast switch fiber so they can keep going longer <laughs> and longer. It's funny, man, because, you know, I got to share the text. You know, I I'd said I just did it and I need a little bit more time before we record. And he's like, perfect. Life is good when sprint aid is done. I said, yeah, but the nasty place it <laughs> takes your mind and body is not. <laughs> so, oh, well, listen, I know. I know it, there's a dread factor before yeah. it. because, and, and so the goal is, and we try to give people middle cues and that is don't think about doing all that. The yeah. goal is to show up and do one and let your body take over after that. Yeah. And, and, and what you should do or in a class session really, really yeah. works well. Yeah. And, and, you know, what's great too is, you know, time is, is what most people don't have enough of. And, and, you know, to be able to do something and literally finish the entire workout in 20 minutes, let alone if you look at the, the total work, what is it? Uh, one, two, three, three minutes. Four minutes. Yeah, four, four minutes. minutes of yeah. Hard exercise. Twelve yeah, and, minutes, and that's week. and that's if if you can get it all the way done. Yeah. So so perfect. Well, why don't we you know again continue? I know you talked about you know and threw some stuff out there on the science. Let's continue on. I think you know people always question things. So uh, let's dive into the science of this, and then we'll we'll wrap up and we'll actually go into some more details of you know who it's for and how do we do it and what equipment and so on and so forth. Well, that's great. If you don't mind, I'm gonna pull this slide up because it just makes it easier for me to explain. So if we took your muscle like this and cut it and look down into the muscle fibers, what you would see is three distinct different muscle fibers, slow, fast, and super fast. And so right here on this, if we color this, this would be dark red. And your body tries to do things with slow twitch fiber connected um, to your brain by one nerve. So there's basically three different nerves. Hedem has researched in five studies in the 1960s, proved this conclusively, called the Hedemann size principle. And basically, if you look and see the slow twitch fiber, there are not that many of them. So but your body's trying to be efficient for you and handle human movement the easiest way possible. Does everything with slow twitch fiber. And this other fiber, the other two types of fast twitch fiber, basically are laying dormant and not being used. So when your brain senses the first part of spin eight, man, this person's going hard and fast, it recruits the large 2A muscle fiber. So you can see they're significantly larger, if we looked at the color, they'd be more pink because they don't get a lot of blood. They don't need it. And so there's a different nerve that kicks in. But then when you're going hard and fast and sprint eight, we're forcing you to recruit all these big, large, numerous fibers, light colored fibers, laying there, lines up with ATPP synergy system of six to eight seconds worth of stored up energy. Then your heart and lungs have to oxygenate all of this. So now you're working the heart muscle aerobically and anaerobically. And this is really the difference between hit and sit. Hit, most forms of hit recruit the fast switch 2A fiber that moves five times faster than the slow, but then it takes true sprint intensity cardio like sprint eight to recruit all this fiber. Great. So there's one nerve here, one nerve here, one nerve here, but the next slide points to that. Well, and, and, before, before you hit, Phil, and, and before you hit that, because one thing that bothers me in the industry and talking to trainers and seeing and, you know, reading online and is there's always this huge, either it's good or it's bad and we're not living in the middle. And, and what I want to talk about here and, and get your opinion on is nowhere in here are we saying that the hit classes that are being done out there are bad and that might not get results. We're not saying that. What we're right. saying is you're not doing what was originally called hit, which was we're now calling sit because it was literally 
full out effort, almost to exhaustion at that particular time where you have to, and you, you, you can't do it anymore. Like that's it. And that has been watered down. So we've created this other uh, category. So it's, it's not good or bad. They're both good. What we could argue though, is that the sprint or the sit is a lot more effective when done correctly uh, with a lot less time. I mean, exactly. And you want, I mean, you want to work that fiber. It's so when we lift weights, and sometimes people don't understand that we're traumatizing that muscle, intentionally traumatizing. So, which which could be interpreted as we're slightly injuring at the microscopic level. So, when you sleep, it heals back bigger and stronger, and that's the adaptation process of the human body. But it all starts with that trauma. So, we're trying to traumatize slow fiber and fast switch two A, which you can see right there in the middle. So, you're getting all that fiber. But then there's a then a significant amount of fiber somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of your muscle fiber atrophies because we don't use it. And it doesn't it's not meant to endure. It doesn't take a lot of work to get there. And so in a sprint eight program, it, you're talking about four minutes of hard sprint intensity cardio in a week's time. You get an hour's worth of cardio of which 12 minutes is hard, intense work in order to get growth hormone release, dopamine release. Uh, in two hospital-based studies we did at King Stars Medical Center, uh, we looked at the results over an eight-week period of time. And what we saw is in two different studies, the average body fat loss without changing your diet is 27%. Woo. Of people don't believe that, but that's what we see consistently for people that want to lose five to 10 pounds. Now, if somebody's fit, lean and mean, getting ready to run a marathon, and that's why they jump in a sprint eight class, for example, those people will still drop body fat by 15% and put on two pounds of muscle in eight weeks. And that's on three days a week, right? Your, your, the recommendation is only in three days a week doing this, correct? Yes. That, that was the only variable we told everybody in the study. And these are physicians and nurses. Now we didn't follow them home to make sure they didn't change their diet, yeah. but the instructions were, this is extremely important. Keep live your life exactly the way you're living it right now. The only variable will be sprint eight three times a week for eight weeks. Mm-hmm. And the results, what we thought we would see is like a 14% drop in body fat because that's what you get with injections. So the when they study, you know, what you the benefits of growth hormone, injecting it, the average body fat loss in eight weeks is 14.4%. What we see with sprint eight is 27% Whoa. for people that want to drop some Ooh. weight. Wow, that's which, crazy. Which is almost crazy, yeah. but it does make you want to clean your diet up because it is yeah. intense. Yeah. Wow, there's a, you know, you're pegging lactic acid eight times, which is n- never fun, but it's necessary to get this huge release of growth hormone. It's funny because I keep thinking uh, there's a, a product I, I interviewed several weeks ago, uh, the founder of a company called you can. And I think that that product would absolutely go perfect with this particular program where it's the carb that will allow you to feed the muscles and it helps with the cravings. Cause I would imagine that if you're doing these on the days that you're doing them, if you're not eating properly, your, your cravings might go through the roof just through the intensity. Well, it actually, it, one of the questions I'll ask people when they first start doing spin eight, once they get through, I ask, are you hungry now? And they go, no, man, I'd be nauseous. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not immediately after, but I'm saying just, you know, later on in the day too. Yep. It, it, we know it suppresses the hunger hormone ghrelin. It suppresses okay. that for as wow. much as two hours. Now, what we don't know is, does it jump on you double in two hours? It may. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we had the research dollars for that, but uh, unfortunately we don't. Matter, matter of fact, it. we, uh, when we looked at dopamine on two people to see if we could get a grant for it, one of the doctors said, uh, man, this is a, this is a cure for Parkinson because it's a dopamine related disease. You got to get a grant. Well, I was told off the record, give up on the grant because there's a drug that sells for $6,500 a month and they're not going to grant you this grant oh, to man. research that. Let's Parkinson. not, let's not get Parkinson's into that. Let's not get into that right now. <laughs> so, so, but well, this uh, is fantastic. Companies, uh, they have lobbyists, exercise really yeah. Yeah. doesn't, other than a few yeah. associations, yeah. Uh, try and people trying to do the right thing. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, let's keep going, man. This is fantastic. Now here, here's a, here's another interesting study. And uh, 
uh, Dr. Trapp. And if you and if you look, most people think, well, sprinters have all this fast switch fiber, recruit fast fiber, nurse runners have all this slow switch fiber. But if you look at this, if you see, see the chart, if you look at the, the dark color right here, the slow twitch fiber, it's a lot of people recruit slow twitch fiber and build slow twitch fiber, recreational runners, distance runners. But look at who recruits the most slow twitch fiber. The sprinters do. They're definitely recruiting all their slow twitch fiber because remember that fiber's laying dormant. And when it's recruited, you're recruiting all of it when you sprint train. Now here's hit. Hit is 2A, but look how sprinters, how much fast switch 2A they recruit versus other forms of training. Well, uh, who here recruits the super fast fiber, the 2X fiber, which can be as much as 50% of your muscle fiber? That's still there. The cells are still there. They're just small and wimpy because we don't use them. And so that's why you want to, when you start sprint eight, start with two reps, slowly build back. If you're sprint running, it takes even longer. It takes six to eight weeks to build that fiber up where you can actually run fast enough to do some, be really productive. But that's a huge point. And that's exactly what Sprint 8 is trying to do for every people of all ages. We're trying to get you to train like a sprinter would train, work all three muscle fiber types comprehensively in a very, very safe way. So you don't have to go out there and pound the pavement. You can do it riding a, a recumbent cycle which is easy on the back, easy on the knees, easy on the skeleton, but still get a great cardiovascular workout process. you work in both processes of the heart muscle, get this huge growth hormone release that really helps on weight loss. That's the goal of Sprint 8, and that's what we're trying to do with it. Get the word out so everybody trains like a sprinter. You're just doing it on a very safe piece of equipment. So I got a question. Yeah, I, I got a question because in my mind, what makes sense is that if I'm – exerting myself at, at such a high intensity, obviously the slower twitch stabilization muscles have to have to increase because the sta- most of the stabilization muscles in the body are, are slow twitch. So I would imagine that when force increases that if your slow twitch fiber types don't also then increase, then you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> so I wonder if that has something to do with, you know, why the, in, in this particular document that you're showing and study that the the sprint x fiber types when recruited at high as as a sprinter they're going to recruit a higher even proportion of of slow twitch fibers you know from a safety standpoint there's there's a, there's a study in here that i can show you in a second it's really remarkable it kind of says it all in one study and uh it went well let me let me hang on to that just a second yeah, no no problem so so we've talked a lot you know about results um you know and and what a client can expect and 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 or a person can expect from going through something like this i know you've had some amazing stories with regards to trainers that apply this within their sessions and, and how they use it. And I'd love for you to share, you know, because there's a part of this, a good part of this audience are trainers. Um, can you explain and, and share some of that, that information? Well, there's, well, we do have a lot of success stories there, but the one I can think of, uh, Ricky Ortiz, he, new trainer, club sports. Uh, he went through and got certified on sprint eight, did the three hour course, got certified, started doing it, said, man, this, this really works. And so he carried all of his new or all of walkthroughs or new members when they came through on a tour. It was Ricky's time. Ricky would take them through and his friends would come over. He would basically take them to the sprint eight zone where sprint eight's built in and the makes his equipment and hit the sprint eight button. He would talk him through and, and show some science. Basically, he would describe probably in a better way than I am right now the science behind it in a very short amount of time. And and people would look at him and say, you know, this guy knows what he's talking about and I feel this program. So he said, when I take them through two reps, it's a guaranteed 12 pack sale. His first month, he did $15,000 in training. And for well over a year, he averaged over $10,000 a month. He told me recently using sprint eight. In a group fashion? Was that that in more of a, this is not, this is different. He's talking about something that I'm reading about in journals. I'm, I'm seeing the site. I'm seeing reports about growth hormone. I have friends injecting growth hormone, and he's telling me I can do the same thing naturally without injections, but actually get better body fat results. And so Ricky did a 
did very, very well with the, with the program. And we hear that from different, different trainers really across the U.S. and other parts of the world even. When people use Sprint 8 and take people through it, they know there's something special about it, and they know I'm not going to do this right by myself. Got it. You know, so fill the class as well. Perfect. Well, you know, this is it's fantastic. And and uh, would you mind diving into and again just really laying it out, regardless of the piece of equipment, uh, exactly what the protocol is for Sprint Eight? It's. It, it, I mean, basically, it's three minute warm up, like on level one or two. Nice and easy, slow. You just want your heart rate to, to, to climb. Nice and easy. The first sprint, just before it begins, you'd probably take the button. Now, if you hit the sprint eight button, it's, it's easy because you can, you can go intermediate, advanced, elite. And, and that's only on matrix. But, five different areas. but that's only on matrix. Matrix equipment is the only equipment that has that. Matrix and regular. Vision, their home, home line. Okay. And it's been there for 16 years. And so we've learned a lot about it from their work. And they, they've really done a great job with it. But you can do it pushing buttons. But I would say level number one or two, nice and easy. And then once you get warmed up, then you want to put it probably level 10 or 12. Go hard and fast as you can for 30 seconds. Shoot for 30 seconds. If you don't make the 30 seconds, that's great. Count it. it but if you stop at 30 seconds, because I'm saying 30, when you could have went 33 or 34, don't count that as a cardio sprint. That may have been hit, but it's not sit, true sprint intensity cardio. Then you drop it back down to level two and go nice and easy and slow, just really slow. You're not trying to make this cardio, but go slow for a full minute and a half. And it's the most important piece of this is don't rush the minute and a half. If you do, that may be your brain playing a game with you to try to get you to go before you're ready. So you can't recruit the fast twitch 2X on the next, uh, you know, it may be part of the exercise paradox playing games with it. So you want to take the 90 seconds, which may seem a little long on the first rep, but after that, I promise it's not going to seem <laughs> very long. If anything, as yeah. you know, it, it yeah. seems like that was just 30 seconds. That can't be a minute and a half. So if people are doing this in a group, which I know that you've recommended just through the motivation and, you know, to, to keep us going a little bit harder, which will always happen when we're doing things in a group in, in for most people. If somebody stops at 25 seconds or let's call it 20 seconds, um, do they just start back up with the rest of the crew or, or is it very important that it's 90 seconds from when you stop? It's, it needs to be 90 seconds, but it looks like it's a ratio, but it's, it's not, it, it, okay. it can be at the 30, 90 seconds. It, it's yeah. a, you know, it, it's ratio, but it's not really for that purpose. It, okay. It's really more about the human body and the energy systems and the muscle fiber recruitment. Got it. And how long it takes to recover. So it takes 90 seconds for you to totally recover all three muscle fiber types so they can be recruited for the next sprint. Okay. If it's 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, you know, it, it may not even be hit. It may just be hard, slow twitch fiber work. Yeah. But if you're getting a minute off, it's pro it may qualify as hit. But then to be true sit, you've got to get that minute and a half recovery and go all out as fast as you can go. And it has to be total exhaustion where your muscles basically just can't propel movement before 30 seconds or Got right it. at 30 seconds. Got it. So, so I've heard, you know, and, and again, we're not talking necessarily apples to apples, but when, you know, when we're lifting very heavy strength training, if we're, you know, doing one RM, two RM, three RM, somewhere in that category, you know, the, the wait time typically is three to five minutes. Is that just, is it different because it's the cardio side versus, you know, because I mean, fiber types are fiber types. So I, I don't know if you have that, that, that question answered, but it's something that pops into my mind in that why would we rest even longer to recruit to fully, or are we not trying to fully recover those, those fibers? Well, and those, those studies showing five minutes are really for power lifters, you know, strength, strength training, 600 okay. pound squats. And so they're trying to get totally recovered plus some. Got so it. It's about okay. lifting more. Makes and sense. So when the measurement is more than getting the five minute weight is, is positive because that will help you lift more. But yep. when the goal is get maximum amount of trauma, shortest amount of time so you get the best yep. adaptation when you sleep from strength or cardio, you, you get it all together in one. 
this way, but yeah, and go going a lot more and going back to your growth hormone, you know, release, it's, it's a specific fiber type, obviously the two X that help recruit if you can recruit those. And this is part of the problem. You need to get the, there, but then there's that. And then I've also read studies about the development of lactate and the impact that that has on uh, the release of growth hormone post-workout as well. Right. And the thing about lactate is, uh, you know, you're pushing that level up. You keep pushing it up. Exercise nausea is the same way. You know, when people, if they do two reps, get a little nauseous, which some people do, what we tell them is, is just back off at that point. And then ne next time, just listen to your body. And what they find is the next workout, usually they can do three without getting nauseous. And then the next time, four, eight, you know, you basically push exercise asthma out the body that way you push the nausea out when you when you stay with it you're pushing lactate threshold up significantly got it got it and you know another question that comes to mind too and i don't know if you have any studies on this or have gotten feedback around how this oh well, i guess you did say that earlier is is the impact on alzheimer's but i'm thinking mental health and mental wellness and you know recall and things like that because you're pushing your brain so tough and, and so hard that that will have a positive impact. Have you seen any of that or is there any studies that you've done? No, I mean, that's a, that's a great, great thought. And what I know Jerry Bauer with the, uh, wrote a couple of nice articles about it. He had lost a lot of weight with the program. And uh, he said, the one thing you don't talk about, you don't talk about what it does for your mental. You need to get into that more because he said, when I do sprint eight, I can focus, I can write, I can do anything yep. for four to six hours afterwards. It's just amazing what that does for your cognitive abilities. And there are several studies now showing and proving that that's true, but sometimes we don't you know, get in that point. But from your emotional health, I can tell you this, from my personal experience, I can have a problem. I don't care what it is, but if, when I do Sprint 8, when I get off a Sprint 8 machine, for some reason, I don't even remember what that problem is. Yeah, I mean, you just get that runner's high and you got dopamine circulating, which is, a, you know, you're not getting it in a drug. You're getting it naturally the way it's meant to be done. And you just feel so good. And life truly is good when Sprint 8 something because I dread it. Everybody I know that's been doing Sprint 8 for years, got a, my buddy that's an actor in uh, Australia, he's been doing it almost 20 years now. And uh, that's how he stays lean at me. He that's said, you know, I still find myself you know, we'll spend eight days. I don't feel good about it. And Jerry Bauer even told me, he said, he and his wife do it together. And he said, just want you to know, Phil, that we love you most of the time, but the day of sprint, not just before, <laughs> the whole day when sprint eight's coming up, we kind of don't like you so much until yep. it's over with. And I go, oh, yep. I, 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 get, uh, it. I yep. get it. Yep. Well, and, and I'm telling you, I, I mean, I'm, I'm literally feeling what you're saying right now after, you know, doing it a couple hours ago. And I just, I feel wonderful, man. I, I feel on top of the game and, and it's, and it's fantastic. Well, you know, this has been just phenomenal and, you know, again, everybody out there, give it a shot, you know, and, and my last question, and, and you've talked to it, but I just want to overemphasize it again. And, and if there's any other information that you want to keep adding that we maybe haven't talked about, that's important, please do. But the progression, you know, obviously there's, you know, there might be people that are sedentary. They never lifted before they, or they never worked out before. And, you know, is this right for them? You know, how do, how do they go about doing something like this? Um, you know, there's one study. Let me, let me flip over this because this, this really kind of tells the story. First of all, this is Maria. It shows the impact on the heart. Let's see, well, let me go ahead and go to this one. Yeah, this is a, looks like a sprint eight study. You look, your heart rate's here and it's going up for the sprint. It recovers during the recovery, back down, back up. So you see, I mean, there's eight reps in there. So they're doing eight reps. The only difference is if you see down at the bottom, they did a 10 minute warm up, and they did a lot longer than a 30 second sprint on the first one. The reason why is these researchers uh, are not working on test subjects in a gym or in a college. They're working on heart transplant patients. Wow. These are patients that just had a new heart put in their body. The reason why they're doing that very simple. The heart muscle has two main processes, aerobic and anaerobic. And when the heart muscle, can, new heart mu muscle put in the body works anaerobically, then good things happen to the body as far as its acceptance. And so. Wow. And this is the conclusion of researchers. You can see it on the screen. 
that's hit, it's well tolerated and leads to a greater improvement as compared with moderate intensity exercise for heart transplant patients. And so that speaks to the safety of it. And we've seen people, uh, I've seen, I've had a heart surgeon or retired heart, a, a retired surgeon rather, uh, 75 years old in congestive heart failure. He can't do long and slow. It gets his heart rate up too high. He can do this and we, we would check, make sure he stayed under 120 and he did. You know, he's not doing, you know, a ton of watts yep. on his program, but he got, he got some. And for, wait, would you mind going back? Cause for, go back to that slide, because for those that aren't watching on YouTube uh, and can see the videos, now the other one uh, with the, with the study on it, the, the study that you're referring to is from the American journal. Uh, can you go back to the, the other, the next slide? <clears throat> nope. The, the one that talked about the study and show the results. It's uh, the American Journal uh, of Transplantation. And one question though I have though, <clears throat> is obviously this is after they've gone through the rehabs that they've had to have gone through. I mean, what's the time period from transplant before you should, you know, go here? I mean, this is an extreme case though. Now, obviously, I mean, we always, you know, if you've had chest pain recently or, you know, a heart, a heart issue, you're going to a heart physician, need to be cleared for anaerobic exercise. And, and, and that's really true. You know, we always, tip, you need to have your physician look at your labs, make sure you're, you're good with anaerobic exercise. If you have any, uh, any problems whatsoever, or you know of any problems with your heart muscle going, you know, going to a physician, you know, make sure you're cleared for anaerobic exercise. But then when, in almost every physician, I've never had a physician yet in 30 years say, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Just to ease into it. But the way they ease into it is two reps and that's it. And then what happens is when people, when their fast switch fiber is not very strong because they have been work, working it and, and, and maybe their um, hit fiber, their, their 2A fiber is not very strong. It's almost like the weakness of their fast switch fiber protects their heart muscle from going too hard and too fast. And they, they can't go hard and fast. But then slowly over time, as they recruit that fiber and it gets stronger, so does the anaerobic conditioning of their heart muscle. It's almost directly proportionate to each other. Got it. Well, man, I, I, I can't thank you enough. And, and obviously for those out there, and I'll put the, the links in the show notes, um, but he's got, you know, the Sprint 8 book. Uh, that he's written. That is fantastic. You know, there's many others too. He's written on, you know, just how to coach uh, speed technique, uh, which I'm reading perfectly. You can see the, the notes that I've got in there. So this has been fantastic. And I can't thank you enough uh, for taking the time uh, for coming up this. I'm so grateful that I've been able to, you know, actually meet you in person and do this with you. Uh, but anything else that you have that you want to share with the audience before we go? Oh, I just, listen, I'm just honored. No kidding, because I know how well read you are. I mean, if you're listening to his program, I promise you, he has researched it and he knows it. This dude reads everything out there. So if you're a follower of his program, you're getting current information that's well thought out. Perfect, man. And it truly is an honor. Yeah, likewise. Well, I can't thank you enough. And, you know, I hope to see you one day. I'm going to I think bring my kid out or something to get you, get some speed coaching with you uh, someday. So I need to get out to California at some point. So uh, if you're in the San Jose area, come see Phil at club sport in, uh, in San Jose uh, until lifetime gets the Walnut Creek club. <laughs> so, but we're all good. So thank you so much for being on and uh, you know, you have a great day, man. 